It's a remarkable phenomenon, an infuriating one for us, a humiliating one for them, observable to just about anyone familiar with the Trump political era. That is, the metamorphosis by some, but not all, outgoing Republicans, when they no longer need votes to stay in office. All of a sudden, they see the light, unshackled, free to speak their real minds about the disgraced ex-president. And while former House Speaker Paul Ryan never seemed all in on the Donald Trump experience, far from it, we're now starting to see what true freedom of expression can do to a Republican. Listen to what he said in a filmed conversation with the global consulting firm where he serves as vice chair. How will history regard people like Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger and people of that their ilk? Maybe it's just, just the two of them. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, they're friends of mine. I think they called out, look, Trump's not a conservative. He's an authoritarian narcissist. So I think they basically called him out for that. He's a populist authoritarian narcissist. So historically speaking, all of his tendencies are, you know, basically where narcissism takes him, which is whatever makes him popular, or makes him feel good at any given moment. And he, and he doesn't think in, in, in classical liberal conservative terms, he thinks in, in an authoritarian way. And he's been able to get a, a, a big chunk of the Republican base to follow him because, you know, he's the culture warrior. And so I think Adam and Liz um, stepped out of the, the flow and called it out and, um, you know, paid for it, paid for it with their careers. Pretty candid assessment there from uh, former House Speaker Paul Ryan. Joining our conversation, former chief of staff of the Department of Homeland Security in the Trump administration and host of the Whistleblowers podcast, Miles Taylor is here. And here at the table, former chief spokesman, my friend, for the he was at the DOJ and former senior advisor to Attorney General Garland, Anthony Coley. So, Miles Taylor, I want to start with you because you spoke out on Donald Trump while you were still a part of the administration. I want to hear, I mean, this is, was, those were pretty powerful, candid words there from Paul Ryan, but it's been a couple of years. Um, what do you think of him saying, calling him now an authoritarian narcissist? Well, Jen, I mean, it's, it's frustrating, of course, because all of us want people who say those things that are Republicans to have said them sooner. And, and I'm guilty of that, too. I even look at when I spoke out and thought, it could have been sooner. And you can make that case for any of these people. It's good to see Paul Ryan doing it now. But what I will tell you from having worked with him in 2015 and 2016 during Donald Trump's rise is this is how Paul Ryan viewed Donald Trump back then. You know, nothing changed. And that should tell you a lot of things. First, about the complicity and silence within my former party, but also about what we are going into. And you noted it at the top end Jen, which is that this is a foreseeable civic catastrophe. And I want to make one thing clear. The United States is not Germany in the 1920s. But America in the 2020s does bear a striking number of resemblances, including the fact that there were contemporaries around the 20th century's most in infamous dictator, uh, Adolf Hitler, that are, are striking. You know, people around that time period warned it was going to be dark, that he wanted to implement tyranny, this whole range of foreseeable policies. But what was important was Hitler's words made very obvious what he wanted to do. We are experiencing that with Donald Trump. His contemporaries are calling him out. His own words dictate what he's going to do. And yet, incredibly, as I always say, we are still zombie walking towards that potential catastrophe. But I hope more Paul Ryans will come forward and that could potentially help us avert uh, what could be the end of the republic. I mean, we're zombie walking while Donald Trump is also echoing Hitler. So there's, there's, I mean, a lot that he's screaming, I want to be an authoritarian dictator. And people are still zombie walking, as you said. That's a great term. I did want to ask you, Miles, because one of the things that um, Liz Cheney has been pointing out, um, you know, is that he, and she's out with this new op-ed in the Wall Street Journal today, where she says, quote, have we forgotten how a depraved Donald Trump sat and watched the violent mob attack our capital and refused for multiple hours to instruct them to stand down and disperse? He showed us his character on January 6th. He's the same exceptionally dangerous and flawed man today. And if Mr. Trump fears he might face future, future prosecution, you can bet he won't voluntarily leave, our, leave office. Our nation can endure bad policies for four or eight years, but once our constitutional system unravels, the damage is irreversible and our republic fails, just as the, so many others have throughout history. The framers understand this. We should, too. The risk is far too great to elect Mr. Trump ever again. Miles, one of the things that Liz Cheney's been talking about that I am also obsessed with is kind of 
what damage he could do within government without even necessarily breaking the law, like how he could use the levers of government to bend to his will. You've worked in government. What scares you the most? Well, the possibilities are almost limitless. And I spent nearly two years asking that question to people. And, and I wrote it in this book, Blowback, but to try to paint that picture, to try to understand what he would actually do by talking to all of my former colleagues at different departments and agencies under Trump and asking them that question, what will happen in a second term? The biggest concerns for me are on the national security side. I think Americans still don't understand the full extent of the president's powers and things Donald Trump could do, bubble wrapped in legalese, that would be damaging to the republic. And one of those that I've noted is there's something in the White House called the Doomsday Book. And for the first time, DHS gave authorization for me to mention this publicly. Uh, and the fact that there are concerns that that book, which is supposed to be used to protect the country in instances of armed foreign invasion or rebellion, it's the president's most extraordinary powers, could be picked up by Trump and used for domestic political purposes. He could invoke powers we've never heard a president of the United States invoke, potentially to shut down companies or turn off the internet or deploy the U.S. military on U.S. soil. Uh, we don't know because you know the things that are in there, the emergency powers of the president, aren't widely known to the American people. So that's a big worry for people like me and others about what he could do. But that weaponization of the government could extend across the interagency to places where we haven't seen it before. The Department of Education, the Department of Veterans Affairs, ways to wield that power and those budgets to help his allies and to hurt his enemies. And to be clear, those aren't just elites. To Donald Trump, his enemies include people who live in blue states. I remember mm -hmm. him not wanting to deliver emergency aid to blue states because yeah. he didn't like them, because they didn't like him.